Okay, I'm going to start. <clears throat> so, our lesson this morning is pray for your neighbor. I think our unit is, uh, what, how to love your neighbor. And this is, today is pray for your neighbor. So, uh, before we get started, let me open us up in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, I thank you that we have the privilege of, of praying to you. I ask that just as the apostles ask you, teach us to pray. Father, I ask you that you will, will help us to, to learn to, to pray to you. It will be part of our, our, our lives. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so my first slide here. Anybody know what movie that is? Yeah, Karate Kid, very good. And um, anybody remember how, it wasn't how he planned, but how, how the, uh, what was it, Mr. Miyagi, how he trained him, how did he start out training him? <laughs> yeah, there you go, the wax on and the wax off, and then, then there was painting the fence. <laughs> yes, yes, and he wasn't happy about all of it, but, but then he learned that, that that training did help him. So. Our student book says that one of the primary ways that the Holy Spirit helps us to grow and shapes us is through prayer. When we pray for others, we're building spiritual skill and strength. And we'll see that more as we go through this lesson. And then again, the student book says, the Holy Spirit changes us, changes us through prayer. For example, when we pray for those who maybe we're having a conflict with, we're better able to see uh, them as God sees them. Perhaps even seeing the frustrations of the other person, seeing things from their point of view. Um, so our lesson here today is from the book of First Timothy. We've been jumping around from book to book. This is from First Timothy. And uh, this verse says, this is uh, Paul writing to Timothy. He says, as I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach different doctrine. So, so where did Paul tell Timothy to stay? At what city? Ephesus. So he was, he was at Ephesus, and I'll show you a map of that. You know, Ephesus is kind of in the middle of it all. It's in uh, Turkey, or there it was called Asia. And uh, you can see it's kind of in the middle of all of, all of uh, Paul's work there. Um, and Paul actually spent three years at Ephesus. You'll see here in the book of Acts, he says, uh, Paul's, uh, Paul says, Night and day for three years I did not stop warning each of you, the people in the area of Ephesus, with tears. So, so Paul says that, that uh, he spent three years at that city of Ephesus, and now he's leaving uh, Timothy as kind of the, the uh, pastor for the people at, at Ephesus. And as many of the cities then had, Ephesus was a city with idol worship. Do you remember what idol was the big idol at Ephesus? Yeah, yeah that's right. Diana, you got it, you got it. And, and in some versions, called uh, Ar Artemis, I guess the same, same thing, but they, they were filled with rage. This is when, uh, I guess, Paul was there and, and the uh, idol, uh, probably the idol makers uh, got things going. They didn't like that. They were filled with rage and began to cry out, great is Artemis or Diana of the Ephesians. So, so Ephesus was a place of idol worship and I'm sure it was a difficult place uh, for Timothy to be the, the pastor there. Uh, um, Paul is going to tell him here to, to live in prayer, to be a, a person of prayer. Uh, the time, let's see, oh, so here's a, just a temple of Artemis. Of course, that is gone now. This is just a, some artist's 
uh, conception of what it looked like, but you can see is a huge temple probably with all these impressive pillars and things. And, and so the people of Ephesus were very proud of their idol worship there. Okay, this one, I know you can't read much of that, but I just wanted to just show you as far as the timeline of Paul's Christian life, right at that first arrow was when Paul was saved, probably about 33 AD, and Paul's was martyred uh, or put to death uh, about 67 or 68. So you can see how many years would that have been? 35 years was the time of Paul's work. And you can see First Timothy there with that yellow star almost at the end. So Paul is writing this towards the end of his life. He's had a lot of experience and now he's going to give some of that wisdom to this pastor, uh, Timothy, this young pastor. So uh, one of the pastoral epistles, we call it. Okay, so um, I'm glad Terry's in here because he gave me this question here. Let's see. So which, which is more important, reading your Bible or praying? Anybody want to say? Terry knows the answer. <laughs> he gave this to me. What's that? Praying more important, okay, okay. Anybody else? Okay, so here is Spurgeon's answer to that. This is what Spurgeon said. When asked, what is more important, prayer or reading the Bible? I asked. I asked them, Spurgeon says, I asked them, what is more important, breathing in or breathing out? <laughs> in other words, you got to do both, right? You can't, you can't put an importance on one and not the other. It's just like breathing, breathing in and breathing out. Um, <laughs> yeah, I got to give Terry credit for that one. <laughs> he was the one that told me that. Um, okay, now so I got the, I got a weird picture here of uh, anybody know who that guy is? What what is he? The, yeah, my fellow. Yeah, and the only reason why I put him on here is um, does anybody get tired of his commercials? <laughs> yeah. It's like yes, I know it, and he always does his own commercial. What's that? Yeah, right, right. I know. It's a, anyway, he does all his own commercials. So, so now, the reason why I'm putting that is I'm hoping today that you won't get tired of the... I'm not going to put slides of him, but it's going to be... Um, Spurgeon has a book of prayer, and uh, I'm going to put I'm going to put a lot of slides of Spurgeon, and I'm hoping you won't get tired of him like you get tired of the my, my pillow guy. So here we go with, uh, with one right now. Um, so here is, here is kind of just a general summary from Spurgeon on prayer. And here he says, <clears throat> My own soul's conviction is that prayer is the greatest power in the entire universe, that it has a more, has a more omnipotent force than electricity, attraction, gravitation, or any of those other secret forces which men have called by name, but which they do not understand. So, so in general here, Spurgeon as we should have, has a very high view of prayer. And that's what you're going to see right from the beginning of this lesson. Uh, but before, before we look at the lesson, I just want to show you a few cartoons on uh, training. You know, so we're thinking about training. And of course, we started out there with training in karate. And uh, so this first, first one is this uh, mom has learned a Taekwondo. And the children say, just, life just hasn't been the same since mom took, took up Taekwondo. So, She's opening up eggs with her feet there. Okay, and then a couple of old guys are, are going to show how good they are at karate, and they're going to break the board with their hand or their foot or something, and the one says, bring a thinner board. <laughs> okay, and this one, I don't know if you can read it, I'll read it to you. It says, uh, this is a math one here. He says, he said, since we initiated regular staff development sessions, we've turned the school around 360 degrees. So if you've turned something around 360 degrees, what, what direction are you going? Same way as you came, right? <laughs> so that isn't, that isn't good. <clears throat> okay, and here's another, another older person doing, uh, doing karate. And uh, the guy say, instead of a black belt, some of our older students, like Mr. Mertz here, prefer the black suspender. <laughs> okay, and one last one here is not training in karate, but training and doing a high five. You ever do a high five? So the two guys, you can, I don't know if you can see their cheeks, they ended up trying to do a high five and slap each other in the cheek. And so he says, all right guys, 
take a little break, then we'll give it another try. So, Okay, so we're going to be talking about prayer here today, training in prayer. So, right off from the beginning here, so this is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, first, lesson, first verse of our lesson. He says, first of all, so this is the priority. First of all, then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. So he says that, that prayer should be made for what people? Everyone. It's for everyone. And then he gives all these different names, though, and you're probably familiar with most of these, but we'll look a little more at them. Uh, like, what would a petition be? That's what we usually think of prayer, right? As your, re your request, right? That's sometimes all we do when we pray is, is we just give our petitions. You know, but he says also with prayers, and we'll look at that word in a second. How about intercessions? What, what might that be? For somebody else. Yeah, that's the way I think of it. You're interceding for others. Um, and then thanksgiving. Don't forget to be, to be thankful in your, your prayer. Um, so when we think about prayer, why should we even pray? Why should we bother? Um, so Spurgeon here, he says, when God determines to do a great work, he first sets his people to pray. So God has determined that prayer is important. So that's why we should do it. If he's going to do something, we pray and we learn that we're dependent on him if anything is going to happen, anything good. And that's what John Bunyan said, the writer of Pilgrim's Progress. He said, he said, you can do more than pray after you have prayed. But he says, you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. You know, in other words, don't just get out there and think you're going to accomplish things for God on your own. You know, talk to God about it. Do it through his strength. Learn to be trained, to be dependent on God. Um, the uh, Got Questions is uh, something on the internet, and it had this interesting little, little story. I thought it was good. It says, uh, when we pray, God does not change his mind, but prayer does change things. So how can that be? So he says, think of it this way. He says, a father plans to give his daughter a car when she turns 16. But he plans on waiting until she asks for it. So when she turns 14, she asks for a car. <laughs> and he doesn't give it to her. He says no. Now she turns 16 and she approaches her father again and expresses that she would like a car. Now he gets her a car. So that gives that same idea of God that we approach God for the things that we, that we need. God has plans for us, but he wants us to ask for it. And Swindoll looks at that as, uh, as this. He says, Swindoll says, that I think up in heaven there's a big room of large boxes ready for delivery. Some of the boxes never get delivered to earth because they were never requested from earth. Hmm. Okay, now let's work at, look at that word prayer. Um, and it's the Greek word, and I, I probably won't get the pronunciation right, but, but prosuki, something like that. But anyway, what the, the meaning of the parts of that word are is pro is towards, and suki is desire, so our desire towards something. So, so that word I think of as our praying in that part of prayer. Remember, there's the other parts. There's thanksgiving, there's petitions, there's intercessions, but there's also praying our desire being towards God, so this is like adoration or, or worship. Uh, and another part of prayer, of course, would be confession that, that isn't in, in this part. Um, Psalms, you know, of course, we can look at a lot of Psalms, our, our worship and adoration of God are expressing uh, David's desire towards God. And here he says, God, you are my God, I eagerly seek you, I thirst for you. you know, so, so prayer should be part of that where we, we tell God that we, we seek after him, we desire to know him better, uh, we thirst for him. Um, okay, and so Spurgeon, here's another Spurgeon slide here, and so he says that uh, part of prayer isn't just petitions, part of prayer is praise. Well, we praise God for the, the praise that he deserves. And so Spurgeon says that prayer and praise 
uh, are the oars by which a man may row his boat into the deep waters of the knowledge of Christ. Uh, so part of it is, as we praise God, we think and we meditate and we remember how, how great God is, and we tell him that. Um, okay, now let's think about intercession. So in Ephesians, Paul says, Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request, and stay alert in this with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Okay, so, um, so we should pray in who? Pray in who? In the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. And then, and then now his, so he says the intercession here, he says the intercession is for all of who? The saints, yeah. So, so here, and that doesn't mean you can't be praying for people that aren't saved, but here in this verse he's saying our intercession is, is for, we don't want to forget the saints, our brothers and sisters in, in the church and the church around the world. Hey, um, could somebody get my clock? I forgot my clock. It's just around the corner. Would somebody get that? Anybody know where it is? <laughs> I, can't, I can't, if I don't have my clock, we'll go too long here and I'll be in trouble. <laughs> Okay, um, Okay. so another, okay, so in the Spirit, so Spurgeon has a slide here on, on how to pray in the Spirit, and, and I thought this was pretty good. I know it's long, I don't know if you can read it, but I'll, I'll read it here. He says, every growth of spiritual life from the first tender shoot until now has been the work of the Holy Spirit. The only way to more life is through the Holy Spirit in us. You will not even know that you want more unless he works in you to desire it. The Spirit of God must come and make the letter alive. What letter is he talking about? The, the word, the letter is in the, in the word of God, right? So, so first, the Holy Spirit must take that word of God, make it alive to you, set it, transfer it to your heart, set it on fire, and make it burn within you or else its divine force and majesty will be hid from your eyes. Thanks, Jaron. Prayer is the creation of the Holy Spirit. We cannot do it without prayer. We cannot do without prayer, and we cannot pray without the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is taking that word of God that we hear or read, and he's setting it on fire in our hearts, right? He's taking that word. We, we take it to our hearts, but he sets that fire in us, and that's what lights that fire to our, our prayer. So the, sp the Spirit is important to, to our praying. Um, the student book says that prayer is, so this is going back to prayer as being training for us. Prayer is directly connected to our personal growth in God's love. The more we pray for others, the more the Spirit fills our hearts with love for them. So, so this is as we're interceding, as we're thinking of others in prayer, it changes our hearts towards them. It builds our heart to grow in love towards other people as we pray for them. Um, and then the student, well, let's see. No, I guess this is a, one, another one from Spurgeon here. This is another one that's a little bit long. Um, but this is on intercessory prayer. He says, remember again, that intercessory prayer is exceedingly prevalent. Now, Prevalent, I think, at Spurgeon's time, probably meant a little different than it means to us. When I think of prevalent, it means that everybody's doing it, right? But I think what he's saying is prevalent means it's prevailing, it's powerful. So, so he, he's saying, remember again, that intercessory prayer is exceedingly prevalent. What wonders it has wrought. The word of God teems with its marvelous deeds. Believer, thou hast a mighty engine in thy hand. Use it well, use it constantly. Use it with faith, and thou shalt surely be a benefactor to thy brethren. When thou hast the king's ear, speak to him for the suffering members of his body. When thou art favored to draw very near to his throne, and the king saith to thee, Ask, and I will give thee what thou wilt. Let thy petitions be not for thyself alone, but for the many who need his aid. You know, so, so that, that is Spurgeon talking about praying for others, and there's power in that praying for others. Okay, we're at verse, no, one more thing before verse 2. Student book, so pray, so sometimes we, we, it's easy to pray for people who we like, and maybe not for people who we don't like, but student book says, pray for that person who gets on your nerves. 
Pray for that family member who rubs you the wrong way. Pray for those who disrespect you. And you know, as you pray for them, you may find that your heart changes t towards them too. Okay, verse 2. For kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a quiet and tranquil life in all godliness and dignity. So who does, so Paul said to pray for everybody, but now who does he mention first to pray for? Kings, yeah, okay. And uh, so I'm going to show you a survey. Um, don't, don't put it up there yet. Though. I'm going to show you a survey of, of who Americans pray for. That's kind of interesting. Uh, where do you think government falls on where Americans, who Americans pray for? <laughs> At the bottom, you think? <laughs> and how about, and this is kind of a sad one, is, is, uh, uh, and I don't think this is true of, of us, but, but uh, where do you think praying for the unsaved falls on that list of who Americans pray for? It's towards the bottom, too. So here I'll show you that, that survey. I don't know if you can read it anyway. It says, uh, so t people typically pray for the first one there, 82% of people pray for their family and friends. Of course, nothing wrong with that. That's good. Pray about my own problems and difficulties, 74%. Well, that's what you'd expect, right? That's petitions. Good things that have, ha that have recently occurred, so that's just 50%, you know. So in other words, when good things happen, sometimes we forget about God. It is good to, to praise him for the things he's done. About my own, now we're getting to less than 50% on these others. It says about my own sin, 42%. People in natural disasters, 38%. God's greatness, 37%. So only a third of prayers would be praise to God. My future prosperity, 36%. Okay, and then now way at the bottom here, people of other faiths or who have no faith, 20%. And then finally, government leaders, 12%. So I guess that falls along. I think that falls along with about uh, those surveys on... Uh, how, how people feel about their government leaders, how many like their government leaders, and it's probably about 12%, you know. But, see, Paul says, it doesn't matter that you don't like them, you still pray for them, you know. That's what you're, that's, that's, you want God to change their hearts to work in, in through, the, through our government. Okay. Um, so, let me see, this next one is, uh, of course, some, some kings wouldn't be good kings, um, and, and, uh, Jesus said, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Do you know who the emperor was at the time that Paul would be writing this, which we said was about 65? You're 65, you know who the emperor would have been? He's a bad one. Well, who's that? Yeah, it was Nero. So, so yeah, here we've got a picture of Nero. Uh, so Nero, I learned, was born in 37 AD. He reigned from 54 to 68 AD. And he died in 68 A.D. So how old would he have been when he died? 30, 31, right? So he was a, a young man. I think, did he commit suicide? I, I think, I can't remember for sure. Um, <clears throat> so verse 3, um, this is good and it pleases God our Savior. So do you want to please God? <laughs> he tells you how to please him here. He said this what he said in verses 1 and 2 is what pleases God. and what, So what is it that pleases God in these verses? To do what? To be a person of prayer, right? To pray for everyone, interceding, being thankful, um, making your petitions to God, being dependent on God, praying for everyone, especially for your leaders. That's, he, God says that pleases him. So if you want to please God, here's one thing he says. Go ahead. I, well, I think so. I think whoever, yeah, it, yeah, I, I think it, pr this whole thing is on, tra that prayer changes us. Yeah, it, it changes our outlook. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So, now, of course, some people don't look at prayer that way at all, do they? I'm going to give you a couple stories here. This is, uh, so, uh, Tony Evans, he says, many people treat prayer like the spare tire you know like you got in your car when are you going to bring out that spare <laughs> when you got a flat right when you're really in trouble and some people treat prayer that way that they're they're going to pray yeah i'll pray when i'm 
when it's the last resort, right? When I'm, when I'm, when I'm down, to, down to the end of my own resources, then I'm going to do it. We forget about it until we really need it. So uh, he, uh, Tony Evans, he tells this story. He says, uh, there was a man at sea in a bad storm. It looked like his boat might sink. Well, he bowed his head and said, Lord, I know I haven't, I've been out of fellowship with you for 15 years now. But Lord, if you will help me this time and bring me safely home, now you might think he's going to say, then I'll commit myself to you. But no, he says, I promise I won't bother you again for another 15 years. <laughs> well, that's not what God wants, is it? God doesn't want, God doesn't want us to avoid him. He wants us to, to talk to him. Um, okay, so let's think about... Uh, um, oh, let's see, do I have one more before that? Oh, yeah, so the, now let's think about prayer meetings, you know? So, so um, of course, we, on Wednesdays, we have a, a, a prayer meeting here. And, and, you know, pastor, as he should, he wants the, wants the church to be involved with praying because it's, 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 it's important. Um, but he's always trying to think of what, what kind of way can we get people more involved, more prayerful, things like that. And so Wearsby, he says, he must have had trouble at his church too, because he says, if I announce a banquet, people will come out of the woodwork to attend. But if I announce a prayer meeting, I'm lucky if the ushers show up. You know? So, so that, that can be a, a problem. Um, but here is what Spurgeon says about prayer meetings. Okay, if a church is to be what it ought to be, for the purposes of God, we must train it in the holy art of prayer. Okay, and then let me keep going here. We shall never see much change for the better in our churches in general till the prayer meeting occupies a higher place in the esteem of Christians. So in other words, if, church, if prayer meetings don't seem important to you, the church is not going to do well at least in God's eyes. And so here he talks about something he calls a grace-ometer, or a grace-o-meter, however you want to say that. And he says, the condition of the church may be very accurately gauged by its prayer meetings. So is the prayer meeting a grace-ometer. See, it's measuring how much grace is in the church. And from it, we may judge the amount of divine working among a people. If God be near a church, it must pray. And if he be not there, one of the first tokens of his absence will be slothfulness in prayer. You know, so, so you can tell how much a church is filled with God's grace by are they a praying church. Okay, so now what if, what if you just don't feel like praying? What should you do? <laughs> so here we're going to, I told you there's going to be a lot of Spurgeon here. So here's another Spurgeon. Spurgeon comment on that. When we don't feel like praying, he says, we should pray when we are in a praying mood, for it would be sinful to neglect so fair an opportunity. We should pray when we are not in a proper mood, for it would be dangerous to remain in so unhealthy a condition. So whether you feel like praying or not, pray. Either way. Um, and then he says, not to pray because you do not feel fit to pray is like saying, I will not take medicine because I am too ill. You know, and, and now I, I tell you, I have heard that. You know, I, every, almost every week I get some, somebody, the nurse says, such and such person called, and they say they're too sick to see me, but can I just send something in? <laughs> and, uh, you know, of course, I'm a softy, you know, so sometimes I will send something in, you know, but, but it's not really the best way, is it? Because you haven't found out what's the matter with them, you know, you're just guessing, you know, but, but that is the way some people want it. Um, okay, so now, the other thing is now let's talk just a minute about praying out loud, you know, uh, praying out loud in a group. And, and, you know, I'm not saying you have to do that, and Pastor never says in, the, in our prayer meetings that you have to do that. He always leaves that open to people whether they want to pray or not. But these are just some things that Spurgeon's going to say as far as, um, as if you don't pray out loud because you're fearful, you know, and there might be a lot of other reasons, it might be good that you don't want to pray out loud, but, but if, you, if you're not praying out loud because you're fearful that your prayer is not adequate, then Spurgeon has a few things to say to you here, and I'm going to just read you those. Okay, so that slide just says, what if, 
What if you want to pray out loud in public, but you are afraid you will not say the right words or you only have a few words to pray? What about then? Should you just be quiet and let the people that, that can pray better pray? You know, well, here's what Spurgeon says. Oh, we got one by Tony Evans, though, first. Oh, so this is, uh, Tony Evans says, there was a man praying publicly in, in church. This young, young man's grammar was poor. After he said amen, a lady came up to him and told him that his grammar was the worst she had ever heard. <laughs> he looked at the woman and said, but lady, I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> okay, now, <laughs> okay, so here's, here's Spurgeon now. He says, a mother can translate baby talk. She comprehends incomprehensible noises. And, uh, you know, so... Probably better than the, the dad, you know. I don't know, maybe, maybe if you're a dad, a little baby, you, you can understand them. But um, maybe you get used to their babbling and you know what they really want, you know. But, but uh, here he's saying that a, a mom can translate that, that babbling. Um, Even so, our Father in Heaven knows all about our poor baby talk, for our prayer is not much better. And, you know, some people pray more eloquently than others, but... You know, if you remember from last week's lesson, we are still, in God's eyes, we're still like children in our reasoning. We are not, we are not perfect yet until we meet him face to face. So our prayers are going to be imperfect, um, but God understands what we say. He knows our, our mind. Um, so Spurgeon then says that, go ahead. That's right, that's right. And, and, uh, Spirit prays for us with what? What, what does it say? With, with groanings, right? Uh, groanings that can't, can't be uttered. And uh, uh, so that's what Spurgeon's talking about in this, in this uh, slide here. He says, groanings which cannot be uttered are often prayers which cannot be refused. So, you know, if, if all you can get out, you know, and probably more likely you're, you'd be doing this when you're praying in your closet by yourself, right? In your in your mind, you you'd all you can get out is some groaning. You can't even put your your thoughts into words. Uh, maybe something is hurting uh, in you, and you all you can get out is groaning. But but God understands that too. Um, okay, and so what if your prayer is too short? What if all you can pray is one sentence? Uh, I think some, some churches do just sentence prayers, you know, to, to get people used to just, just saying a, a prayer where they don't feel like they have to pray so long. So Spurgeon says here, true pres- prayer is measured by weight, not by length. A single groan before God may have more fullness of prayer in it than a fine oration of great length. So, so the length of the prayer is not the important thing. It's your heart in that prayer. Oh, okay, so that... I guess that's it for that part. Now we're on to verse 4. Uh, and we're still on the first section, so we'll have to keep moving here. Who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? Okay, so, so God wants who to be saved? Everyone. That's what he says. He says he wants everyone to be saved. And, and you know, uh, back in the Old Testament, uh, he said some similar. He says, the declaration of the Lord God is this. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. You know, sometimes... We, we might, you know, this week that a terrorist got killed, you know, and, and uh, there was a lot of pleasure about that, that person, but, but to God, he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked person should turn from his way and live. So that's what God wants, is people to turn. And then Jesus said this, he says, he said, you are not willing to come to me so that you may have life. So God wants people to be saved, but why isn't everyone saved? What is it? They don't want it. They don't want it. They don't want it. They, they're not willing to come. Probably their sin, right? They want to keep their sin, so they won't, they won't come. Uh, okay, so now that we're done with that first section, does anyone have any comment, questions on that? Um, you know what? We're going we're gonna to do a verse on that. You know, I think that what, I mean... I don't know that there's ever been a time in my life that God couldn't say there was some sin in my life that I haven't fallen short in some way. So I would say he does hear me. But I, I think when, I, when, we, when we pray, we should come to him asking him for forgiveness of those sins. I, I mean, 
Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and of course, you know, a sinner, you know, I, I can't say particularly in that verse, but a sinner just in general would be, versus a saint would be someone, a, a saint would be someone who's received Christ, has forgiveness of their sins, has the righteousness of Christ. Well, like, so I would say that I approach Christ in Christ's righteousness, clothed in his righteousness, even though there is still sin that I need to confess, that I need to talk to God about, and in prayer, as I read his word, hopefully he's convicted me of those things. But, you know, I, I think for the person who hasn't come to Christ, hasn't been saved, their first prayer needs to be that prayer, that, God, I need you to save me. That's the prayer they need to pray. Yeah. Anybody got anything else? Yeah, in the context of 1 John, he's, he's been building this case about those who are true believers and continue to look to Christ and going to the propitiation for their sins versus those who I think have come into the church but are saying there is no sin in me oh, yeah. and I don't need you know to continue to draw near through faith in Christ and repent and so I, yeah when you get to that verse I think Thomas mentioned you get that very clear distinction that there are those who John turned around and said, y'all that say you haven't sinned, and you are the ones continue to, pr- to practice sin, really. Yeah. Yeah. And in your practice of sin, you have no true heart in coming to God in prayer. Yeah. And he does, therefore, it's true. Yep. So, whereas, as we come, you know, God, if God doesn't hear the prayer of people who have sin in their heart, Probably in the room going to hear our prayer when we draw near to ask for forgiveness and be cleansed from unrighteousness, right? This is exactly what John tells him to do in First John 1. Mm-hmm. So, and God, John says very clearly, God does hear that prayer and is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. So, I think it. I think that verse is really talking about the attitude of heart in, in prayer. Yeah. Okay. I I think we're going to get to a verse that has to do with that. Let me. Let me. <laughs> Go on to this section. So he says, okay, so now he kind of changes his focus, but we're going to stay focused on, on prayer. You could use this as a salvation verse too, but so he says in verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. So, so how many paths are there to God? Just one, right? You know, that's, you know, Jesus said that he was the only way, and now he says he's the mediator. He's the one that goes between man and God, you know, and um, so... Um, the other thing I think of with this verse is that we don't have to go to a priest to confess our sins. We don't have to go to a man to, to talk to God. There's no mediator that we need. We can talk directly to the Father through the Son, not through a person. Um, okay, so now uh, just a little bit different from this, but just for a couple of illustrations of what we are doing when we pray. I thought this was a good illustration here. He says... Uh, if I throw out a, bo- a rope from a boat and someone ties it to the pier and then I pull, do I pull the shore to me or do I pull myself to the shore? Which would he be doing? Be pulling himself to the shore, right? Pulling the boat. He's not pulling the shore to himself. So prayer is the same thing. It's not pulling God to my will, but aligning my will to God, to the will of God. Prayer is surrender to the will of God. I thought that was a pretty good illustration. I think there might be a... <clears throat> okay, so now maybe you've, you've been praying about something and you don't seem to get any answer. Nothing seems to change. Um, so what if you've been praying and you don't get any answer? I think Gus Burden's got a couple ones on that here. He says, uh, You may fear that the Lord has passed you by, but it is not so. He who counts the stars and calls, calls them by their names is in known danger of forgetting his own children. He knows your case as thoroughly as if you were the only creature he ever made or the only saint he ever loved. Approach him and be at peace. So God is hearing you. Don't feel like he's not hearing you. Just because you haven't gotten the answer you want could be other things, right? So here he says, um, 
Spurgeon says, frequently the richest answers are not the speediest. A prayer may be all the longer on its voyage because it is bringing us a heavier freight of blessing. Delayed answers are not only trials of faith, but they give us an opportunity of honoring God by our steadfast confidence in him under apparent repulses. So it's continuing in prayer, even if it's for the same thing, is, is not a bad thing. That's showing God that you still trust him, even, even as problems persist. Um, okay, verse 6. Uh, so now, kind of, kind of, I think, kind of changes away a little bit from, from prayer here, but he says, who gave himself? He's talking about, you know, he's mentioned Christ being the mediator, so now he's got to say something about Christ. And he, so he says, Paul does this pretty often, he says, who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. So, so Jesus is what for us? He's, what did he do for us? He was our what? Our, our ransom, you know, that we needed a, a ransom. And, you know, have you ever thought, I, when I was reading this, I thought about um, who was the ransom paid to? You know, who, 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 did, who did Christ pay the ransom to? Uh, to, to, to save us. And, uh, you know, you, know, you kind of wonder, well, was it, was it Satan? Did he have to pay a ransom to Satan or, or what? You know, and so desiring God says, to whom did Jesus pay a ransom? Jesus died to rescue us from God's wrath because we could never, ever pay the massive debt that we owed the Father. And the payment was the blood of Christ. So he says here, uh, desiring God, John Piper says that the ransom was paid to the Father uh, for, for our forgiveness, and it was the blood of Christ. Okay, uh, let's see, I think there's another Spurgeon one. I think we only got five minutes here. Jesus Christ gave himself for you. So when we think about, so if you think about that verse as being part of prayer, when you, when you think about Christ, think about all that he has done for you, that he has ransomed you uh, from the, the, the imprisonment that you the bondage that you had to sin. And so meditate on that thought. And Spurgeon says, One night alone in prayer may, might make us new men, changed from poverty of soul to spiritual wealth, from trembling to triumphing. Um, you know, so, so, so we don't have to live in, in fear that we can live triumphantly, but we want to concentrate, we want to meditate on the greatness of God. Okay, that completes the second section. Anyone got any comments? I'll try and go quickly through this last section here. Uh, verse 7 says, For this I was appointed a herald, an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. And a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Why does, after Paul says, I'm an apostle, why does he have to say, I'm not lying? <laughs> Isn't that funny that he does that? Why does he have to do that? Because people are accusing him of lying, right? He wasn't one of the original apostles. And, and so he has, to, he has to, you know, God appointed an apostle out of due time, right? Out of the time of the other apostles. He has to tell them, I'm not lying to you, I am an apostle. And he says he's also a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Um, and, you know, so, so it's, it's, uh, it's good to be a, a leader and a, and, a, and, a, and a teacher, but Spurgeon says here, I would rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. That's how important prayer was. Spurgeon. He said, I'd rather teach you. I get one man to be a prayer warrior, be better than ten men who are preachers and teachers. And then, uh, I like this one too, I think this is Spurgeon also, he says, we can't all argue, we can't all, we can't, but, but we can all pray. We cannot all be leaders, but we can all be pleaders. That's the one I like there, is, is we can't all be leaders in the church, but we can all be pleaders to God, right? We can all be be people of, of prayer, pleading to God. We cannot all be mighty in rhetoric, but we can all be prevalent in prayer. That's another one that uses that word prevalent. We can all be powerful in our prayer lives. Even if we're not powerful speakers, we can still be powerful in our prayer lives. Uh, verse 8 says, I think this is the last verse, Therefore I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. So he wants... He wants, uh, wants uh, us to be people of prayer. And then what position does he say? <laughs> Living up holy hands. You know, we'll talk about that if we get a, a chance here. But, but I think the important part there is the holy part. <laughs> and that might go along with what, what Tommy says there. Is, uh, 
he, you know, I don't think it's so important whether you got your hands lifted up or if you got them uh, folded uh, or however you got your hands. The important part is, are they holy hands uh, without anger or argument? Um, so Spurgeon says here, I want the men in every place to pray. Prayer should be the natural outflow of the soul. We should pray because we must pray, not because the set time for prayer has arrived, but, but, but because your heart must cry unto the Lord. You know, so our hearts are are so filled like a like water behind a dam. You know that that there's pressure there. Our our hearts are longing to pray to God, so we pray because we we have to pray. And he says, lifting up holy hands. Uh, I'm going to go quickly by this. You know, if you look through the Bible, people have prayed in different positions. Uh, a lot of times it's kneeling, right? People kneeling. Uh, of course, you could kneel and still have your arms in the air, um, but. I don't think the position of your hands is so important. It's the position of your heart, right? That your heart is, is bowing uh, to God. Um, so Elizabeth Elliot said, kneeling is a good way to pray because it's uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, so I don't know if you spent much time praying on your knees, but that, that, is, that keeps your attention, right? If you, if you pray while you're laying down in bed, you might fall asleep praying, which may be a good way to fall asleep, but it's not a good way to keep praying, right? And uh, Jim Elliot, he said, um, you know, of course, that was Elizabeth Elliot's husband who died uh, in the mission field. And he said, that saint who advances on his knees never retreats. So if you're, if you're a praying person on your knees, I, I think the main thing is, is praying whether whatever position you're in for prayer. Uh, Moody says, every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. You know, but I think there the important thing is a praying person. God's going to do something. He's going to do it through people who are dependent on him. Uh, and then uh, Howard Taylor said of his father, Hudson Taylor, who was a missionary to China, he says, for 40 years the sun never rose on China that God didn't find Hudson Taylor on his knees. So in other words, every morning Hudson Taylor, missionary to China, was on his knees praying for his work there. And that was the way that things got done. Um, yeah, Psalm says, who, I'm, I'm at the sign, I just keep going. Psalm says, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has a clean hands and a pure heart. You know, and, and so that's, that goes along with what Tommy was saying there too. You know, to, to, to ascend to the Lord, we have to be holy. But, you know, there's two ways of looking at that, right? One is we become holy and a pure of heart by what Christ has done for us, by accepting his sacrifice for us. We become righteous. Uh, in our position before God, but in some place I think that's talking about what he says, holy hands. I think it's a practical righteousness too, right? We, we don't want sin in our life, uh, uh, and it's separating us from God. So uh, we're going to look at James actually in the next unit. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts. Double-minded people, be miserable and mourn and weep. You know, so sometimes we have to come to God mourning, um, and if I had been aware of malice in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So that, that's along with Tommy there, too. We don't want to keep things that are separating us from other believers, especially, or even, even anybody. Those things can keep our, inhibit our prayer life. You know, Jesus said, if you come and are giving your offering at, at the altar, but you remember that you've offended somebody, take care of that first, then give your offering. You know, first go and be reconciled, then come and reconcile to me. Uh, so the final, one final thing of Spurgeon here, he says, prayer pulls the rope below and the great bell rings above in the ears of God. So now how are you going to pull that rope? You know, so he's saying there's a rope to pull, then a bell will ring in heaven. He says, some scarcely stir the bell, for they pray so languidly, which I had to look up, that means sluggishly. Others give but an occasional pluck at the rope. But he who wins with heaven is the man who grasps the rope boldly and pulls continuously with all his might. So, you know, how are you going to, how are you going to pray? Are you going to just give a little tug on that rope once in a while? Or are you just going to keep pulling with all your might? So, that is it. Anyone have any last comments? I'm afraid I went a little bit long. Hard to do. Yeah, go ahead. Saying, God, I thank you. I'm not like that person. And yep. He really lists off 
everything that he thinks is holy about himself that he's done. Yeah. And then you've got the other guy, the tax collector that comes beating his breast yes. and weeping and says, be merciful to me, a sinner. Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus looks at those guys and says, which one will come justify? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so yeah. Yeah. I think when Paul used that phrase, those who are lifting holy hands, it's not those who come to God and say, hmm. all right, God, here's everything I've done to be holy, so now you can hear me. Yeah. But really, rather those who come recognizing it's all because of Jesus. Yeah. That I can come boldly and make for a request on him because God is full of mercy and grace to us in Christ. Yeah, that's right. And, and of course, that guy, the one who was justified, didn't have his hands up to heaven. What was he doing with his hands? You, you said it. He was beating himself. You know, he was angry with him, himself because of that sin, and he pleaded for God's mercy. Yeah. Do you think of anybody different in church law? Well, I'm not to raise your hands, praise God. I think they're one of you. Yeah, that's where, what, what is it that uh, God told Samuel? Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And so I, I think if we find ourselves being judgmental about someone's outward expressions, yeah, yeah, yeah. we should first look at our heart, ask God to search it, and make, it, make that clear to us. Because you are a wonderful God.